Well, New Zealand is a valued member of uh, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation uh, and Development. I was uh, in the region and uh, your government invited me uh, to visit. And this is a great opportunity to uh, discuss the government's reform agenda and, and explore ways <clears throat> in which we can support them, but also to uh, provide advice on our assessment and our recommendations on how uh, the New Zealand economy uh, can be further strengthened into the future. The OECD has carried out a few reports into New Zealand in recent months. Education, we're slipping. Climate change, we're falling behind. The economy, we're struggling, whether it's high prices or a lack of competition. What are we doing wrong here? What needs to change? Well, I mean, New Zealand does a lot right. I mean, you are a successful, globally focused, export-oriented trading economy. You're a global leader in agricultural production and, and a major export of agricultural products. I mean, the assessments that we made are, are there to uh, provide advice on opportunities for improvement. And, and yes, I mean, New Zealand and other countries around the world do face a number of challenges. We've gone through a very a difficult period uh, in um, our history. Uh, we had a one in a 100 year pandemic and all of the economic and social implications that flowed from that. We have major uh, wars and conflicts in, in different parts of the world that are having uh, implications around the world, in particular for open uh, trading economies, including New Zealand. I mean, sometimes we might think that some of these events are very far away, but they do have implications all around the world. And so, I mean, what, what we see in uh, New Zealand is, is an economy that uh, continues to grow. I mean, growth uh, is uh, somewhat subdued last year and this year. I mean, there's been very high inflation and higher interest rates, which, which have weighed on growth. But we, we see growth uh, improving uh, into next year as uh, inflation comes down and as some of the reform uh, initiatives uh, take effect. But yes, I mean, there are some areas where we <clears throat> suggest that uh, New Zealand should consider improving uh, its policy settings, in, including when it comes uh, to very low levels of productivity uh, in New Zealand. Uh, I mean, the level of competition in the domestic market uh, is uh, very low, and there, there are a range of reasons for that. When it comes to education, I mean, New Zealand continues to perform better than the OECD average, but what we've been seeing uh, is a declining trend. And so what we're saying is, I mean, really focus on lifting school attendance again, focus on improving uh, your curriculum, uh, make sure that you, you strengthen uh, teacher education and also strengthen the level of support provided to teachers and schools. When it comes to climate change, I mean, this is a global uh, challenge and, and there are particular <clears throat> circumstances in New Zealand, uh, of course, which, which we understand. But um, really, it's, it's a matter of uh, New Zealand continuing to find the best possible ways uh, to make its contribution and, and to be part of the global uh, conversation on how we can uh, meet uh, our global climate objectives uh, as effectively and as cost effectively as possible. New Zealand has slipped in the rankings for education. Are we falling behind or are other countries shooting ahead? What's going on there? Well, you're not falling behind. I mean, so as, as I say, I mean, uh, when, when we, our PISA test, our program for international student assessments uh, has identified that New Zealand students, uh, when it comes to math, science and reading, uh, continue to perform better than the OECD average. Um, so so that's, that's good news. Uh, I guess the challenge is that over the last decade or so, what we've seen is a declining trend. And since uh, the pandemic, I mean, that has been further accentuated. So, I mean, there have been challenges for education systems all around the world. So, I mean, it, it's no, there's no reason uh, for uh, panic, but it's, it's a matter to, in a considered uh, and deliberate fashion, uh, to make uh, some decisions and take some steps to get things back on the right trajectory. And on that, it seems many of the recommendations the OECD has made over the, over the years has been ignored. A capital gains tax is a big one that has been recommended so many times, still isn't happening. Uh, do you ever have any hope it will or, or what's going on there? Well, look, I mean, the OECD uh, is, you know, independent and, uh, you know, it's comparatively easy for us to make recommendations. We understand it's much harder for elected governments uh, to uh, manage the politics of implementing some of those uh, reforms. I mean, we, we continue to uh, call it as we see it and, and it's then up to, and, we, you know, we, we seek to inform the public conversation as well uh, with our recommendations. Now, you touched on a, a number of issues there. I mean, when it comes to the level of competition. I mean, you know, of course, I mean, New Zealand is a, is a comparatively smaller economy and, and geographically uh, quite remote. So that comes with its inherent 
uh, challenges, but what we see in the New Zealand market is um, essentially a very high level of concentration across a number of sectors in the economy and uh, some, some major um, players who are not feeling sufficient competitive uh, pressures uh, to deliver the best possible prices and the best possible services. So there is scope uh, for uh, New Zealand to strengthen further the competition policy framework to further strengthen the mandate and the powers of the New Zealand Commerce Commission, for example, but also to make it easier uh, for new businesses uh, to enter the market, to reduce some of those barriers uh, to entry. I mean, we, we, we've assessed that, uh, you know, when, when it comes to product market uh, um, regulations, for example, I mean, New Zealand has one of the most stringent um, and, and most business unfriendly approaches today and, and we would strongly suggest that this is an area where some changes should be made. F foreign direct investment. Uh, New Zealand has one of the lowest levels of foreign direct investment across uh, OECD member countries as a share of GDP and, and, and there are a range of reasons for that that uh, New Zealand should try and, and, and tackle. And so um, there is opportunity uh, to, to make positive, positive decisions that will help strengthen uh, the economy, but also help improve living standards uh, further. And when it comes to housing, um, you know, you, you've had a very high uh, level of um, net migration into New Zealand in, in, in recent times. And, and yes, I mean, your infrastructure and your housing stock is not keeping up, which is uh, putting uh, very significant pressure and strains onto the system, that we, which is something that will need to be addressed. On infrastructure, we really struggle to build here. It's expensive. Politicians chop and change projects. What lessons could we learn? What do we need to do? Look, I mean, we've, we've had very good conversations uh, with the government here over the last uh, a few days. And um, I mean, I think I mean, the government here is very alive to the need uh, to uh, focus on infrastructure investment and focus on identification of uh, the best possible infrastructure projects and take a more rigorous and systematic approach to the identification of projects and the financing of those projects, including uh, with uh, private finance. And, and there are examples in uh, countries around the world, including in Australia, where uh, some reforms have been undertaken over the last decade or so that New Zealand could copy. And, uh, you know, we certainly uh, strongly encourage encourage the government here to look at some of the successful experiences in countries around the world. But, but you know, it, it's going to be important to make it more attractive for capital investment to flow into New Zealand to fund some of those projects, as well as identifying those productivity enhancing uh, and, and, you know, in, in quality infrastructure projects for the future. How then does being a member of the OECD benefit New Zealand? The OECD is an organisation that brings together 38 like-minded market-based democracies from around the world. I mean, the United States, uh, Japan, France, Italy, Germany, uh, all the way to you know New Zealand, Iceland, Luxembourg, and and these are countries that um, share information about policy approaches, uh, facilitating mutual learning, and, and New Zealand is able to benefit from the expertise from countries around the world that that can help. Uh, inform decisions here, but, but of course uh, also be part of the conversation about how we can together best tackle some of the shared global challenges. And, you know, New Zealand as a globally focused and export-oriented trading economy, what happens in the rest of the world matters to your success. It matters to the living standards of people here in New Zealand and to have the opportunity to help shape uh, the policy conversations at the global level uh, through an organisation like the OECD, I think is a very good opportunity for New Zealand. If we flip that around, what's the point of the OECD today and into the future? Well, um, the OECD help, you know, is, uh, aims, uh, our aim is to help governments around the world to deliver better policies for better lives. And, you know, we facilitate data information uh, exchange to help uh, inform the development, the evidence-based development of best practices and, and good policy practice and, and to provide advice to governments around the world accordingly. And, and we, pro we provide a platform to facilitate international cooperation on a whole range of you know, important issues from climate change to digital transformation to international tax reform, uh, un competition, trade, I mean, you name it. And, and so, uh, again, I mean, I, it's, it's a two-way street. And New Zealand has been a member now since 1973, so f 51 years of, of membership. And, and, and I'd like to think that over that period, it, it's been a very good partnership. In all your travels and looking at the global economy right now, we're in a bit of a precarious state. How would you describe it? And have we reached a turning point post-pandemic yet? Well, 
I mean, post-pandemic, there was a very strong recovery uh, all around the world, including uh, here in New Zealand. Uh, you know, I have to say, I mean, we, we, go, we are going through a very challenging period. I mean, after the pandemic, we had, uh, you know, Russia's war of aggression uh, against Ukraine, which, which uh, is still underway and which had major economic and social implications, uh, you know, in economies around the world. Um, and, and the conflicts in the Middle East now and, and geopolitical tensions more generally. And just, so there are a lot of challenges. And it's quite remarkable in that context uh, that the global economy actually uh, continues to grow. I mean, it's growing below uh, historical trends, but it's growing at above 3% uh, per year this year, next year. And, and I mean, we are seeing like we're quietly optimistic in, in terms of the growth outlook. Inflation is coming down. Global financial conditions are improving. But yes, I mean, there are, there are downside risks. Uh, there are tensions and there are uncertainties. And, and the geopolitical risk is, is one of the major risks uh, that, that we're dealing with. But, uh, but you know, if, if, you, if you think about everything that's going on, um, things are actually in, in a relatively good position, economically speaking. And globally, Politicians are increasingly pursuing protectionist policies. Why is that happening and does it worry you? Well, yes, we are worried. I mean, uh, in qu unquestionably, um, open markets, uh, global trade, the expansion of global trade has uh, delivered significant benefits uh, to people and, and to countries and people all around the world. Um, it's helped lift um, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and it has helped li increase living standards all around the world. Um, fragmentation, decoupling, protectionism, um, it, it would make all of us poorer if that trend continued. So we are very much a, a voice in support of uh, open markets, free trade, uh, and, and indeed the sustainable expansion of, of global trade. Uh, and to, but, but we do need to ensure that we make globalization and global trade work better for people, and that the benefits of the sustainable expansion of global trade are more widely shared, that global trade delivers uh, inclusively uh, better outcomes for people all around the world and across across economies, but, but also that we better manage some of the social and uh, environmental uh, impacts when it comes comes to trade. But it, it's, it's, it's important with trade that we don't throw uh, the baby out with the bathwater by, by turning in on ourselves because ultimately th that will make everyone all around the world less well off. And how does it affect OECD countries? If we look at India, for instance, New Zealand is pushing really hard for a free trade agreement with India. Obviously, they take quite a protectionist approach. How do we do that? Is that a pipe dream that we'd ever get an FTA with somewhere like India? Well, I, I think it's very important to have that ambition and it's very important to keep working on it. Um, I mean, New Zealand has done exceptionally well when it comes to uh, trade agreements and economic partnership agreements with countries and jurisdictions around the world. I mean, New Zealand uh, has uh, trade agreements uh, you know, with China, with uh, the European Union, with key economies all, all around the world. So you, you've got a very good network of trade agreements, which is important for a trading nation like New Zealand to get the best possible market access. And, and I mean, I think it's, it's uh, very good that New Zealand is working hard at getting the best possible deal with India, which is a very strongly growing economy in uh, a very uh, strongly performing region of the world. And Donald Trump wants to introduce blanket tariffs on imported goods. Is it the OECD's place to push back against that kind of economic populism? Well, look, I mean, the OECD is a non-partisan uh, organisation. We work with uh, elected governments uh, of the day. We work with the governments that are chosen by the people uh, in uh, our member countries. So I'm, I'm not going to get myself involved in the domestic uh, political uh, debates in individual countries, but but you know our position at the OECD when it comes to trade is very clear. Uh, we uh, strongly believe in in the positive uh, power of um, you know global markets and and indeed uh, open uh, markets uh, on a level playing field, uh, on a global level playing field as as the way to boost living standards for countries all around the world. You kind of touched on it um, in a previous answer, but are there downsides to free trade? And you talked about um, making sure that people are looked after, etc. Is that an admission that perhaps it hasn't worked as well as it should in the past? Well, you know, of course, when, when you engage in competition, uh, you know, in a global market, it can be uncomfortable and, and, and sometimes it, it can cause disruptions and, and it's important for public policy 
to ensure that, that people are not left behind, that to the extent that uh, people are impacted by uh, you know, structural transformations or, or, or by uh, shifts in, in the sort of areas of economic activity in which uh, an, an economy can be competitive in, then there needs to be support in terms of uh, upskilling, reskilling, uh, transitional uh, support to make sure that people genuinely uh, can participate and benefit from the opportunities uh, that engagement in global trade offers. And uh, in the past, that has not always uh, you know, been done uh, in the way that it, that it might have. And I mean, in the context of some of the transformations in front of us today in relation to the digital transformation, the green transition and so on, it's, it's very important that we get that piece right too, that we don't leave people behind, that those that are most severely impacted by some of those transitions in a negative way receive the level of support to be able to get uh, into the position where they are able to participate and benefit as well. In what way could OECD countries work together to ensure the digital giants pay their fair share of tax? Well, th that we, we have been doing that for, for some time. I mean, we've um, got a proud uh, record when it comes to uh, tackling tax avoidance and, and base erosion and profit shifting. Uh, for more than a decade now. I mean, we've uh, pursued ex uh, automatic exchange of information, increased transparency when it comes uh, to uh, tax disclosures, and, and we've implemented the uh, uh, buys erosion profit shifting action plan since 2015. And, and right now we're in the process of uh, pursuing uh, the two pillar reform of our international tax arrangements, which uh, involves a reallocation of taxing rights to make sure that big multinational companies pay their fair share of tax in jurisdictions in which uh, they generate profits, and including these big digital companies. And, and of course, under the second pillar of that reform, we have introduced or we've pursued the implementation of a global corporate minimum tax at 15%, which is now a reality. I mean, about 50 countries around the world have already legislated, and it, it means there's now a self perpetuating momentum where countries will have to follow suit in order to. Uh, protect their own revenue base uh, in, in the context of a global minimum tax that can be applied in countries where a, a corporation, a relevant corporation, hasn't paid uh, up at least 15% of tax uh, in uh, countries around the world. Another fast-moving area, generative AI. Where do you see the opportunities and threats of that? Well, look, you know, when it comes to artificial intelligence, including generative uh, AI, I mean, you know, obviously there are great upside opportunities, but there are also new and evolving uh, downside risks. And, and it's important that we get the policy settings right to seize all of the benefits, uh, to seize all of the upside across health, education, uh, in terms of productivity improvements and, and, and so on, but, but also manage uh, some of the uh, downside risks and implications, you know, make, to make sure that there can be safe and ethical and trustworthy uh, AI. Uh, and in that context, uh, I mean, the OECD has developed uh, a set of standards uh, to help inform uh, government decision makings and, and help inform uh, legislative and, and, and policy measures uh, by governments. And, and we're also helping to facilitate a global conversation on, on how we can ensure the right governance arrangements are in place.